Lord, we give you praise, we give you glory, we thank you tonight. We ask that you break the seals and open the scrolls so that we can read the covenant that has to do with this locality upon the face of the earth. Grant utterance so that the weight of your counsel will not be diminished in any form and in any fashion. And the strength of your emphasis in this hour will rest upon the hearts of your people with much gravity. And it will be uh, like casting viable seeds upon good soil. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Now, you help me, you help me with, with little strength. There are, there are demons here that we need to deal with. All right. Turn your Bible quickly. We will need to do a lot of Bible study since this is our first time coming into the Cape Coast region. We will need to establish our entrance into this place with the perspective of the kingdom of God. Turn to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. Before we begin to take this flight, I would like to request, just in case um, someone's handset is still switched on and it has the potential to interrupt the meeting, I want to ask that you consider putting it on silence as we reverence the Lord because His presence is in this place. If by any means you find out that you are without a sitting position, uh, I think there are still some seats that are empty. Are they allowed to sit there? All right, so there are some seats that are empty here, like eight of them. If you are standing without a place to sit, the ushers will direct you so that we can take advantage of the possibility of maximum capacity utilization of this facility. Daniel chapter 1. You are welcome in the name of Jesus. I salute all the lecturers in the university that have taken their time to be present here. I greet you in Jesus' mighty name. And all the functionaries in the kingdom, pastors, intercessors, and prophets alike, I greet you in the name of Jesus. All right, we'll do Bible study for 35 minutes. In the third year, I'm reading from the book of John, Daniel chapter 1, beginning from verse number 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which were carried into the land of China to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Aspenas, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring setting of the children of Israel of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skinful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science, and such as had the ability in them to stand in the presence in the king's palace, and of whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans and the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of wine which he drank so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king I think I'll stop in at verse 6. Verse 6. 
And among these were children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Nebuchadnezzar was such a great monarch of stature. It's quite a character to be considered seriously in that he pioneered the concept of globalization. The context of every president most often is the influence that he wields in the, in the midst of the territories under which his political power has recognition. But Nebuchadnezzar was a greater feature and figure than just a president of a nation. There were nations that were under him, there were kings that were under him. He had a wonderful administrative structure that extended the frontiers of his influence to continents. So, for instance, if Nebuchadnezzar was feasting, if he feasts, his celebrations will last months, and it will be celebrations across continents. Meanwhile, you need to understand that when uh, I don't know what to call them politically. When the engineers of our current social architecture began to conceive the vision of globalization, they found out that so much infrastructure was real needed to create the framework to realize the dream of making the world a global village. Are you still with me? At any point in time I notice you are not understanding, I will reduce the syllabus. <laughs> so things like internet had to be discovered that could blot out the diversities of space and time and uh, provide connectivity things like Facebook you can interact with people without meeting them physically because of the potential of the internet and social media. All of these infrastructures were needed to really actualize the dream of making the world a global village. And all of these infrastructures were not there when Nebuchadnezzar was the king of nations. I don't have time to dribble this man. He is an icon in scripture. And among men, you know, our God is called the King of Kings, but among men, someone was able to approximate the idea of the King of Kings. And he was Nebuchadnezzar. When Nebuchadnezzar marches with his army on your ground, you have need to intercede. Because even their arrows alone can blot out the light of the sun. He was such a man that kings ran errands for. His glory was so vast that he likened himself to the very person of the God of heaven. But I want to show you the secret of his strength. When Nebuchadnezzar's army conquers a territory, there are several kinds and several qualities of people that he brings into active public service. Not everybody comes into the service of Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, his glory was so great that in order for you as a fugitive, to be prepared to stand before his presence, it will take at least three years. First of all, you would need to be taught the language of the Chaldeans, which was like the official language 
of the world in those days. I don't have time to take you into Bible history. Just the way English is not your mother tongue, but many of us are more fluent in English language than some people that grew up in Liverpool. That's the influence of the vision of a king of kings. When a king of kings comes into your territory, what he does is that he deculturizes you. He makes you forget that you are from Cape Coast. He makes you forget that you are Ewe. Gives you a new language, gives you a new name. Causes your mindset to shift so that you put on a new identity. Such was the influence of Nebuchadnezzar. And it came to pass that the great Judah, the beloved of God, because of iniquity, lost their covering. And it was Jehovah himself that gave them up to Nebuchadnezzar. You know, in these days of grace, there is a superlative emphasis on a grace that is not amazing. Such grace that looks like license to indulgence, license to trespass. Such grace that is an, a weapon that people use against the actualization of God's dream. In this day of such strange grace, we undermine many things that are attributed to the administration and the workings of the kingdom of God. It will interest you to know that the day you gave your life to Christ, your salvation was not just an organic reality. Your salvation is also an administrative reality. Because our salvation is threefold. Our salvation is a historical reality that is, is rooted in the Bible. Because the Bible reveals that Jesus died according to the scriptures. That is historical. Are you there? The Bible says that, that many as received him, to them he gave power, authority to become the sons of God. There is an organic aspect of it. There is a life imparting aspect of our salvation. And that is actualized the moment the Holy Spirit comes to take residence upon our heart he opens us to the chamber of the life form called this away and the life form called this away gives us the consciousness of the things that are obtainable in the kingdom of god knowing that the proof of life is consciousness and thirdly there is an administration under which you were released the moment you gave your life to christ for the Bible says in the book of John, when Jesus was speaking with Nicodemus, Jesus said unto him, that was the closest that Jesus went in defining what it meant to be born again. John chapter 3, verse 3. He said, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. There is a realm so solid more solid than the realm of the natural, but he cannot verify the existence of such a solid realm, such a mighty administration. So in Jesus' words, the proof that you are born again, the implication of your being born again throws you into a context of kingdom administration. So there is an administration that you are submitted under and that administration is going to exercise its authority over your life and that is the only way God can bend you and bring you to the point where you can achieve his divine purpose for your life so there's a historical part there is an organic part and there is an administrative part I don't have time to work on the things I'm telling you I'm just trying to bring your consciousness to something so if it is true that there's an administrative part, and that is what Jesus said when he spoke these words, 
Are you still with me? I'm seeing that you are not understanding me. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And that's the, one of the only times in the Bible that Jesus uses the word first. And in the Greek, that word first is proton. Proton. For those of you that are in chemistry, you will understand what proton means. Seek ye proton, the kingdom of God, as a matter of priority. That's the building blocks of the spiritual reality that you have entered into. There is a priority, there's a cycle that you must take. And it says, seek ye first. Seek to be under the influence of this administration. Seek to be under the influence of this government. Your identity is going to come out of this government. Your identity is going to come out of the administration that this government wields over your life. He said, more than anything you need, seek to be under the influence of that government. Because if God cannot exercise his authority over your life, then you cannot approximate to his will for your life. And the reason why God needs to exercise his authority is so that he can accomplish his will. Are you with me? So Nebuchadnezzar has a strategy. He has a strategy of governance that gave him that kind of widespread relevance. So I said that the king of Judah and his people were delivered unto Nebuchadnezzar. That was, a, that was a pitiable moment. Israel had to bow, contrary to the promise that God gave their ancestors, that no man will be able to stand before them all the days of their lives. But there's a contradiction to that promise. And Israel had to bow her head to accept the rule of this monarch, Nebuchadnezzar. Now, this, this was how it played out. Are you still with me? Apart from the fact that the people were taken into captivity, the Bible also revealed that the vessels of God, the vessels, the sanctified vessels that were in the temple were taken as booty. I need to explain that. For instance, if we go to the marketplace right now in, in Cape Coast, what's the name of this city? What's the name? This is this Cape Coast, this city. It's called what? Cape Coast. All right. So if we go to the market of Cape Coast and we buy 10 glass cups, then we keep two at home and bring eight to church. And we, we say, these ones belong to God. So, and the priest collects the eight cups, put them on the altar, and then takes the anointing and anoints them. From the moment he anoints those cups, those, those cups are sanctified. Those cups, it is illegal thereafter for any of these cups to be used the way the ones in your house will be used. The only way these ones can be used is in the Lord's service. It doesn't have any of that mundane use. And the day you put it to mundane use, the God of the cops will appear. It's just that you, just like you go to Nogopo and you take a goat. You see, I've been talking about God. No, nobody spoke. The moment I mentioned that place, life came back. <laughs> you take a goat to Nogopo. You give it to the priest and say you are just your heart is full of thanksgiving. <laughs> then in the evening you now go back to the priest and say ah I this I have changed my mind. Let me take the goat back. If you succeed you are not likely to succeed but if you do you have taken the goat to your house <laughs> and things will no longer be the same. Nobody asks you to come and dedicate the goat to the shrine. But if you have done that, you no longer have jurisdiction over that item that you brought to the shrine. It is the spirits that will determine how it is used. If you put it to any mundane use thereafter, the spirit will haunt you. 
So they took up the vessels of the house of God as booty. And when they got to Babylon, the booty was so much that they just closed it in into the house of their gods. Hallelujah. Then the king gave an instruction to a eunuch. As penas. If we have time, maybe tomorrow we'll talk about the eunuchs. The eunuchs. But today I'm trying to introduce the subject. So we need to be friendly today. Tomorrow, if the Lord wills, we will go into the eunuchs. And the king spake unto Aspenas, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring setting of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princess. These guys that Aspenas was giving commandment to fish out from among the vanquished people, there was no old man selected among them. Aspenas was not asked to look for old men. Now I'm reading verse 3. He was not asked to look for old men. He said, he said and he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, the ones that are in, in line in line of ascension to the throne you should look for them the ones that are princes in the land look for them the instruction that was given to Aspenas did not capture commoners did not capture rural dwellers it captured the people that were in their universities people that had the ability to grow into leadership in the days to come. I chose this scripture deliberately because the people asked us was asked to look for I, I, in this university. People like you and me. And I will show you what Babylon does to young people. See, those ones that are of the king's seed. Those ones that have royalty in their blood. Say, so look for them. Forget about the people in the... Ah, there's one village we, we wanted to visit in Volta. I've forgotten that name. Forget about those people. Come to Cape Coast. <laughs> now, you see, you are not aware that Satan has he described you that they should capture you. You are not aware. You just came and said, ah, this is a good place. The Aspenas was already, this is a secret, secret directive. It was not on newspaper. He said, look for the king's seed among them. Look for the seed of princes. Next verse. Look for children in whom there was no blemish. Now, I was born with facial palsy, so I've, I can't command this part of my face. I've never closed this eyes since I was born. So if, even me, I, I will be disqualified in this one. <laughs> because it, it, it said, look for children in whom there is no what? Blame. But well favored, that means very handsome, very powerful physical outlook. The ones with with broad chest and biceps, the ones that have that are promising. They, you see, the sisters are laughing. <laughs> I'm seeing smile. The moment I mention broad chest, hey! skillful in wisdom, cunning in knowledge, and that's what you do in the university. And understanding science. Do they offer science courses here? So this is a prescription that was given to Aspenas, and all of them are found in Cape Coast University. Such as had the ability in them to stand 
in the king's palace to whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So this is what Babylon does. Ba Babylon looks for potential. Babylon cannot develop potential. But Babylon looks for innate, inherent potential. And then Babylon creates a system by which you are educated in their own language so that all of your giftings, all of your potentials will be used to adorn Babylon only. Babylon is not hoping that you will fulfill the purpose of God for your life. They already have a purpose for you. And they want to use all of your gifts. Babylon will not invest in anyone that, that doesn't have gifts that can extend the influence of her government, the coverage of her government, the frontiers of her kingdom. The only set of people they are willing to teach the tongue and the learning of the Chaldeans are such people that are already bags of potential. There is a certain school in Nigeria. In order for you to gain admission into that school, uh, you must score A's in everything. Right? So, it is no, not a wonder that the school produces the best students. Not because the school really adds to you. The school just hunts for the best. Do you understand it? They don't have the capacity to make champions out of charlatans. They look for champions and anoint them. <laughs> That's Babylon. They have an eye for gift. They have an eye for endowment. Then have an eye for skill. Then when they see this, their requirements, they pretend as if they are doing you a favor. Give you employment in their own ministry of wisdom. I will tell you about the ministry of wisdom um, subsequently. And then teach you their language. Teach you their own wisdom. So you convert your endowment into their wisdom and then you translate it through their language to build their system. The moment you get to Babylon, by the time you walk there for two years, you will forget where you are coming from. You will be thoroughly absorbed into its vast system. And you will be manning one of the gates of knowledge to ensure that the kingdom's glory increases from one level of glory to another level of glory. It will interest you to know also that Babylon is the metaphor that is used to depict Satan's kingdom. The wealth of Satan's endowment to achieve the philosophy of driving you away from God. He said, that's what I want to use your endowments to accomplish. Now, I've, I've not finished. I still need to tell you about Babylon. When you... Meanwhile, you are all in Babylon now, but you are not aware yet. But as we go, as we continue in the study, <laughs> you will find out that you are in Babylon now. <laughs> Verse 5. So... The first thing that Babylon is going to do, haven't seen that you are an A student, you have potential, you have capacity. The first thing that Babylon will do is to teach you their own learning. You know, you learned something from Judah, but you are going to learn their own wisdom and also their language so that you can step down uh, your content into their own, the conduit of their system to build this glory. Huh? Second thing that Babylon will do to you, and that's where I will stop this evening. We'll open this up, then I will continue tomorrow. We'll open. We can't even do the eunuchs. That part of the syllabus, we cannot do it. And we can't explain the meaning of 666. It's in the book of Daniel that we can explain it. 
2 Samuel, we have 6. In the book of Daniel, chapter 2, we have 6-6. Six, six. And then in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, we have 6-6-6. Six, six, six. If you don't understand 6-6, six, six, you can't understand 6-6-6. Six, six, six. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. All right, so verse 5 is my emphasis for the night. We will. This is another investment that Babylon makes on this children of skill that are gathered from the nations of the earth and the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king i don't know um what's your name what Kabash. Oh, that's a strong name. <laughs> what are you studying here? What are you studying? Biochemistry. How many years is biochemistry here? Four years. But in their own university those days, it was three years. And while you are... Okay. You, what level are you now? Final year? 300 level. All right, so... Kabash is in 300 level, he is studying biochemistry, but he takes care of his food and his drink. But in the university of those days, they will give you drink, eh? and they will give you food. And your learning will be for what? For three years. At the end of the three years, the king is not just a king, he's also the chancellor of the university. You will come and stand before him, and he will examine you. You are not following. But... All right, so let us start with, since I don't understand the language of the Chaldeans, I would have started there by teaching you people two-letter words, the alphabet, but I don't know it. But I know the king's meat, so I will start from there. This is the second investment that Babylon will make on your life so that you can have the capacity to download your content, your potential, and use it to build their system. You, you get that? All right, so... Let us explore the Bible and find out what exactly is the king's meat. The king's meat. Can we go to Matthew chapter 16 quickly? Matthew 16. I now give me Matthew 16 verse 5 a scenario found expression that I need to draw attention to quickly because Jesus was misunderstood and because of that he decided to step down his communication from the high mode of communication he normally uses in order for the misunderstanding to clear out and when his disciples were come to the other side they had forgotten to take bread then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the living of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they reason among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. See, there was a misunderstanding. Jesus normally communicates at a very high level. You will need to meditate on his utterances then wisdom will begin to distill it into your heart like rain. But because of the sharp misunderstanding, Jesus had to break the communication down so that, because that day, misunderstanding was not going to be allowed. So they reasoned among themselves saying, it is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, because nobody told him, he just perceived it. He said unto them, O ye of little faith, 
Why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? We are still talking about the king's meat. So Jesus is saying that the subject that I'm raising before you has nothing to do with meat. What is it about? Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Neither the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many baskets you took up? That means I can decide to do a miracle and we'll have bread now. So the emphasis is not about whether you came with bread or not. But I'm trying to teach you something quickly. And how is it that you do not understand that I speak it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaving of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Next verse. This now the understanding came to them. Then the now and there then understood there how he bade them not he bade them not beware of the living of bread but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So when we talk about meat we're actually referring to doctrine. So the first thing that Nebuchadnezzar does when he welcomes you into his kingdom, and this is kingdom, the aspect of his kingdom he welcomes you into is the educational aspect. He's hoping to give you meat. He's hoping to feed you with his own doctrine, his own philosophy. And the moment he succeeds in feeding you with a philosophy that is contrary to the philosophy you came with, your life, no matter how endowed you are, becomes a platform to adorn Babylon. As long as there's a switch in your doctrine, a switch in your value system, a switch in your ideals, you become a candidate that is adorning Babylon with your endowment. If you have followed my teaching online, you would have realized that I'm an unapologetic preacher of blazing holiness. You can't... I don't only like righteousness, I hate wickedness with passion. Most of you like righteousness, but your score with wickedness has not been settled. So you can still commit an abortion. Even though you like righteousness, you can accommodate a little. Yeah. So you must have realized that. So a pastor called me and said, hey, where are you going with this your holiness thing? That in one of our cities in Nigeria, okay? And that's the city that holds the largest number of pastors. He said, eight out of ten pastors in this city have side cheeks. So, I don't know where you're going with this, you're holding it. Are you going into the past or into the future? That is the voice of a man that Nebuchadnezzar has changed his doctrine. One of the indicators that your doctrine has changed is that your life is no longer based on the Bible. It's based on the re relativism of your sociology. So you now view yourself and say, well, I'm not the, among the bad people. Well, I just have two guys, two boys that I'm servicing. The, the real bad people. Ah! You have already accepted a doctrine from Nebuchadnezzar. That's why your value system has shifted. And the Bible is no longer your reference point. You have imbibed, you have eaten from his table. And Jesus said, I, I was not talking about bread. Are you guys ignorant of what happened when I prayed on bread and we fed 5,000 and how many baskets you picked up?
He said, just in case you forgot that, are you, have you also forgotten when I had seven loaves of bread and I prayed on them and we fed 4,000? And how many baskets you picked up? The baskets you picked up was much more than what we started with. So the issue is not about bread, but the issue is about the philosophy of the Pharisees. You see, in, in this school, are you there? In this school that these guys are, these Jewish boys, these guys from Judah, are coming to enroll. The values they had from home will not survive there. There are meticulous ways in which you will give up your convictions and accept the principles that govern the education and the educational system. Right? Brilliant ways. And you, you realize that, you know, they make it look like a thing of honor because it is from the king's table that they will feed you. Not from a book up. Not from the backyard. The quality will be the same quality that the king uses. So when you come into the place, it looks like an elevation, looks like a promotion. But men like Daniel held on to the customs that they learned from their village. They entered into this place. And you need to know that these boys, these Judah boys, they were like, ah, this is central region. Can you give me the name of some of the remotest places? These Judah boys were from those kind of places. They were from villages. But there was something about them they will not give up. It's their conviction. It doesn't matter the civilization. They don't take the shape of the civilization. They shape it themselves because of their conviction. You are not with me. So because I have been so loud on the master, on the issue of holiness and personal discipline and all of that, there are ministers of the gospel that hate me with passion. Yeah. The moment you have eaten from Nebuchadnezzar's table, you won't like people like us. People that are village boys like us that still hold on to the traditions we learn from the village. You won't like So there's a conflict. And I need to show you two sides of the pole so that, oh, there's no time. So that you will find out where you stand. I, I'm trying to, I'm not trying to preach a message to you, I'm trying to show you a map so that you can identify your longitude and latitude on that map. Your location. How you have migrated. Whether you are a product or victim of relativism, trying to compare yourself with people and then to assure yourself that your life is still, yes, yeah, still reasonable. Unknown to you, you have departed from the stand of the, the scriptures because you, you eat the king's meat, but it's not plenty. You eat small. So you think you can still keep your weight, maintain your outlook. The moment you start eating it, you have migrated. And many of you sitting here have migrated. You came from homes, very staunch Christian homes, and you were released like, like, like arrows into the wall. So that the proof of what you have gathered under the tutelage of parents and the churches that you attended will be tested in Babylon. You know, while I was on campus, I was... I was very rugged. I was a radical Christian. That is uh, not normal. The, you know the crazy. Ah, that was how I was. You can't even discuss sin with me. I come into the common room, people smoking will stop smoking till I leave. Because I was radical. That, hey. I was so radical that cultists were afraid of me. Cultists with weapons. That was how I was. 
So I don't know whether they wanted to set me up or something. Those, one of those days, my dormitory door, you know, you, you can't stay alone. Four people in one room. So I was staying with the gangsters. I was staying with gangsters. And I like that. So we agreed that we can't be locking our door. The door has to be open. That one of them said they can't keep keys. So the way we'll do it is... <laughs> Leave the door. And those guys were so rugged that you can't even steal from that. Hey, they were... Hey! And I was also a radical. <laughs> do you know that as rugged as those guys were, we used to pray in that room. Mm, we, we, we'll pray first in the morning and call on the name of Jesus. That's the only way there'll be peace now. We have to agree. They can go out and be gangsters, but in the morning. Jesus. Jesus. Say Jesus. Say Jesus. <laughs> Everything in your environment is determined to make you begin to accept a new doctrine. And some of you have already swayed. You're already floating in the philosophy of the realm. So our room had no lock. You just come in and you go out. So you can come in, find someone with ladies. All right? They, it's okay. They can even greet you and say, ah! Well, okay, your book is there. Your book is there. Yeah, so. So I used to stay all, all night reading and praying because my room is a brothel. And I was like that for one session because I did not want to eat of the portion of what? Of the king's meat. One of those days I was in the room trying to get my stuff and the lady just came and, and removed her clothing. I think she forgot who I was because... <laughs> she came with a doctrine. A strong doctrine. The king had add, added pepper to his chicken. <laughs> his pepper chicken that the, that the king was offering that day. I preached the gospel to that lady. And somewhere in the process, she had to take her and... Uh, 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 it, it was interesting to know that my room had no key and no light. There was... You are, you are not... You are not... <laughs> there was no light. The agreement, the first agreement was that we will pray. Then the second agreement is no key, no light. So this is how we balance this, this matter. Prayer must be in the room, but no key, no light. Came back from the lectures one day with my lab coat to do some reports and all of that. And then the court people had fought. And they had poisoned my roommate to die. And the court guys, the rugged guys, were there as, as I was coming. He was asking for me, just asking for me, asking for me. So when I came, I wanted to pray for him. The Lord said, I should ask him, who, who is his mother? His mother is a minister of the gospel. But he is the head of the cult on campus. That was the day I had the opportunity to present the gospel to him. Because he was afraid of death, he accepted. <laughs> Slept. He woke up and vomited the poison and rose up and told me, I said, Pastor, that prayer has saved me, but me, I am in darkness. He put his thing up.
Job chapter 23, verse 12. Job gives us a perspective here. He says, neither have I gone back from the commandment. You know, there'll be challenges to move you away from the commandment. He say, this is Job trying to tell God that, see, me, there were opportunities for me to discard my convictions, but I have not gone back on the commandment of your lips. I've esteemed the word of thy mouth more than my necessary food. Can you see? The word of his mouth and food, meat and so there are two things. You are within two things. It's either you will stick to the word of his mouth or you accept the food from the table. And the moment you begin to accept the food from the table, you begin to migrate. Your prayer life will begin to die. You begin to have relationships that the Holy Ghost in, in you will be expressing a sense of rejection. But it's as if you are so bound that you cannot liberate yourself from the shackles. There was no man that mistakenly became great in the kingdom of God. Every one of us that is in this room, Satan is fighting to gain mastery of your mind and to plant in your mind such seeds that have the capacity to turn your destiny into something that after 10 years, when you look at yourself in the mirror, you ask yourself, are you the one? One of those court guys that was in my room when the hit man was poisoned, he watched me that day because he knows how the hit man cried cried and called my name they had to come to the lab to get me from the lab my colleagues thought something had happened that hey, his pastor they came to call pastor oh and as we went there it was poison that guy watched how i prayed for him and few minutes after the prayer he slept and that was what he saw that made him give his life to christ that guy he's born again today My school was one of the most notorious higher institutions of learning. You are either a cultist or you are, a, you are an extreme believer, a radical follower of Jesus. When I mean radical, I mean you are not afraid of death. So even the people that carry guns, they are afraid of you because why are you not afraid of death? You are not human. Those were the situations we grew up under. He said, I have not what? Gone back on the commandment of his lips. I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. So this is Job saying and giving us the reasons for which he lives a fasted life. He does that in order that he might prioritize the commandments of God over and above his need for food. And as long as you can conquer greed, you will, you will reject what the king is offering. As long as you can conquer your appetites, you will reject what the king is offering. So we need to look at a few appetites and how to conquer them. But are you there? Are you following? All right, so let me take you to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Then show you the law of appetites. 1 Corinthians, quickly. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. He said, know ye not that they which run in a race run all, run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. It means there are rules. There is a way you can run and you will not obtain. So Paul is counseling you to run so that you might what? Obtain. 
Go on. He said, every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. He's telling you how to win. How you are going to win in this race. That's what he's telling you. If you are striving for mastery, the rule is that you must be temperate in all things. And I need to explain to you what it means to be temperate. Are you there? Temperate means that you must be in charge of your appetite. All right. Uh, those days in the university in Nigeria, there's something we call Nougat Games. Nigeria University Games Association. Uh, because uh, the football team, the Nigerian football team will need to get footballers, young footballers that can come in. The basketball team will need to get amateur basketballers, the karate team, the judo team, all of that. So the campus was the pool from whence uh, these functionaries were extracted. So, and the festivity that was the platform for the scouting was the Nuga Games. Now, in the city, in my city, there are two universities. So, and only one Taekwondo champion is going to come from that, that region, right, to represent that region in a more sophisticated tournament that will now yield the ultimate champion. So while they were doing the tournament in our own region and our two universities were competing, the guy who was the best in Taekwondo, he went on break, ate so much chicken, came back. When they put him on the scale, he was heavier than the, the the category, the weight in the, yeah, it was heavier than the category. So the coach put him on six days dry fasting. Now, you are not with me, you are not with me. The dry fasting was not because he was going for a crusade. The dry fasting was because he wanted to strive for the mastery. The rule of striving for the mastery is that you must be temperate in all things. You must have a grip of your sleep life. Some of you sleep the sleep of death and you have died. <laughs> if you sleep that way, you can never be a spiritual man. You can be something else but not the master. And that's why Paul says before he began to give us insight, he said run in such a way that you will win. Not everybody will win that is running. That was when he entered into this matter and said, every man that striveth for what? Mastery is temperate. They put him on six days dry fasting. After the six days dry fasting, what they, was the day where they will come and test officially whether their, their weights fit into the category. By the time he came from six days dry, they had to support him to stand on the scale. He was exactly the last limit, the upper limit of the range. They, they documented it. That's when he went to eat. <laughs> Meanwhile, the guy that was the Taekwondo guy of our school, because everybody knew he was Taekwondo, he was a black belt. Uh, this is how he used to walk. Like this. <laughs> when they came for the competition, the man that fasted broke his two legs. He broke that our man's legs. The, the legs with which he was doing like this. <laughs> because our man could not, could not strive for mastery. In this race that we are talking about, the number of runners is inconsequential. What we are saying is, only those that are striving for mastery will obtain. It means that a larger population of students that come into this place are going to be products of the king's meat because only few will learn the way of mastery. You must master 
your sleep. You must be in control of sleep. You must be in control of food. You can, you can see food and decide not to eat. Anytime you have an appetite that you cannot say no to, you are already invited to the table of the king. You can see free sex like I had that night with no light, no light. The place was quiet and cold. Are you Santuri? Misa Kamori Akili. But I said, no. That's the way of mastery. The opportunities for you to indulge yourself is available. But you have the masculinity to say no. And if you cannot say no to yourself a thousand times, you will not be able to say no to others. It means the moment the king invites you to the table, you say, okay, ah, we have not seen this kind of meat in our village. Whenever you notice that your eyes are no longer yours, your eyes have x-ray, you can see beyond clothes and identify the person in naked form. Uh, the reason why many people are laughing is because their eyes need a touch. The eyes need a touch. When your eyes become like that, you will need two days of dry fasting for you to own the eyes again. It, it's no longer yours. The moment a lady passes, you are gone. You are gone like that. That was how we almost died in Lagos when a bus. I was in the front. I was the one that can tell the story because I was in the front with the driver. A lady passed and the driver was worshipping. That was how he rammed us. Our blood was about to be poured on the altar of that worship. You know what saved us? You know that road divider, the road divider, the, I shouted on him. So he now used the tire, climbed the road divider like this, and then came down. He was, he was gone. The reason why he went is because he had no mastery. And every man that strived for the mastery is temperate. Do you realize? Oh, no time. Jesus. Oh. Can I do something? I open two scriptures, then I'll shut the Bible. Right. Even though we can't finish this number one, but at least you have a good idea. I won't come here tomorrow. I will move to number two. Now, let us take a look at Luke. The book of Luke. Now, I want to give you a summary. Uh, this summary uh, is 30 years captured in one verse. Right? I will show you 12 years captured in one verse, 30 years captured in one verse, um, 20, 18 years captured in one verse. Then I will stop. All right, go to the book of Luke chapter one. Luke chapter one, this is the prophecy of Zechariah. After he rest, his tongue was restored to him and John the Baptist was born. Verse 67, Luke 1, 67. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied saying, blessed be the Lord God of Israel for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David that as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets which have been since the world began that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers to remember his holy covenant 
the oath which he swore to our father Abraham, Abraham that he will grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And then this is a direct utterance to the child. And thou, child, shall be called a prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the Lord to face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high had visited us. To give light to them that sit in darkness and the shadow of death. To guide our feet onto the way of peace. Then he gives us an executive summary of the life of John the Baptist for 30 years. So this verse is 30 years old. It's the compression of 30 years. This is number one. And the child grew. How did he work? He worked strong in spirit. Stop. Stop. Now, even though he's a child of prophecy, it is possible for him to become a rogue. But you are not aware of the fact that you existed as a seed of eternity before you were formed in your mother's womb. It is in that context he assigned you to the purpose that you are supposed to fulfill. There was a man sent from God. His name was John. He was sent from eternity. His name was what? John. The same came. It was the same way they sent John that John arrived. John was a revivalist from heaven. When he arrived, he was a revivalist on earth. But you, they sent you as an evangelist. You are still, the heaven is looking for you because <laughs> you have, you are not the same man that was sent. You are not the same man. So heaven is still looking for that. Uh, we, we sent an evangelist. What? No, he has partaken of the king's meat. He has a different doctrine. And as long as he holds that doctrine, the purpose of God for his life cannot be accomplished. So it's not the same man that was sent that arrived. So it is possible for you to be sent and not fulfill the purpose for which you were sent. These are the things that were done to John to ensure that John was exactly what he was prophesied to be. And thou child shall be called a prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender message of our God, whereby the day spring from on high had visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and under the shadow of death to direct their, our feet onto the path of peace. That was his own prophecy. Are you there? And then the Bible now revealed to us the mechanism that took place in order for him not to be a victim of Babylon. The child grew and worked strong, not in soul, but in spirit. So the emphasis of his growth was spirit. You see, the problem with you is you're already a biochemist. Your soul has drank of the knowledge of this age, but your spirit is flat. And that's why you are fed that weight. Anything that blows on you will change your doctrine. The child grew and he worked strong in spirit. Huh? He was confined and quarantined in the desert, kept away from civilization until the day of his showing forth unto Israel. This was how he gained temperance. This was how he gained mastery. When he came out of that wilderness, he cried out, Repent, for the kingdom of God. What are you crying? There's no body. Your life has no conviction. So there's no cry that can come from you. The king's meat has dissipated your concentration. You no longer have gravity. You can't locate your, the center of gravity. There's no emphasis. You are just a rolling stone. The child grew and worked strong in spirit and was in the desert until the day of his showing forth to the Israel of God. In the case of Jesus, his own summary, let me show you Jesus. Are you there?
Luke chapter 2, verse 52. This is the summary of 12 years. This For Jesus, this is 12 years. Oh my. Are you following me? Now, if your life doesn't pay attention to the growth of your spirit, you are on a mission to become exactly what Babylon wants. You will get the education. You will stand before the king, but you will serve and adorn Babylon with all of your treasures. He said, he that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. So a man that knows he has a destiny with God, you will know that he knows when you see him exercising discipline and restraint. It's a proof that he knows he has a destiny that is greater than him. When you find someone that is loose and loud, he is dead while he's yet alive. This is the summary. Jesus. Oh, I wish I had time for us to walk some scriptures. You, you will just sit down and see the Bible like a computer. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. What, what is John's summary? And the child grew and waxed strong. Where? In spirit, and was in the deserts. There were certain levels of exposure he did not accept before time. Do you know? Oh my! Do you know that I was on cable when I was twenty something? I was on cable TV in Africa when I was twenty something years old. I had invitations to to ten countries, and I went to my father and the Lord. I said. Am I matured enough to begin international ministry? He said, yes. I will bless you for that. He said, you are sure? I was 29. I, me, myself, knew I was not ready. You know why my father in the Lord said, I will bless you for it? He showed me a young man that was 21 that was already started international ministry. So, you're 29. So I got his blessing, but I accepted an invitation when I was 31. Right? That it, I, I don't know. With something around that, I don't remember again, okay? Now, but between the time I got the approval and the time I went, I was striving for mastery. Those were the days when I fasted and my stomach was almost flat to the back. There was nothing you would present to me that was, that was attractive if it's not God, if Jesus is not on it. So when people were preaching about uh, uh, um, prosperity and personal success and motivation, those kind of things were stinking to my to my to my ears because I saw a little of the glory of God it didn't look like motivational talk it was stinking in my eyes and you know what when you focus on God God will make you prosper I found that and when he makes you prosper you'll be bigger than the prosperity so it won't be anything when you find people that, uh, you know, ego, there's a way they want you to respond to them. That's the corruption that comes with the vanity of wealth. It means the person did not strive for the master. He's been caught up by the table of the king to serve something else other than Jesus. Two years to labor. Two years to strive. So I went on that mission, I came back, I submitted the reports to my father and the Lord and, and to God. And I felt I was ready. He didn't know, I didn't know that what God did was that he allowed me to experience international missions. That was when I saw my first cripple rise on a crusade, international crusade platform. Yeah, I saw five cripples walk that day. Then I thought that that was how it would continue. God would now allow me to go to 
five nations now, then ten. After experiencing that, he took me to the cave again for seven years. In fact, he even, he even removed me from the pulpit. This is our own pulpit. Too. This is our pulpit. I, I gave up this pulpit to somebody else and stayed away from it for seven years as a pioneer. And the church I was attending, I was close to my house. When I come, the ushers will say, I was there for seven years. Nobody knew I was a preacher. He wanted to kill the appetite for the pulpit in my heart so that the pulpit, will, it will not be a performance. It will not be stage. It will not be show business. <laughs> it will not be show business. It will be because Jesus spoke. Not about anything that I think. I left this our own pulpit for seven years. The people I left the pulpit in custody of were not faithful. But God will not allow me to say anything for seven years. Have you ever been in that, in that, in that state? For seven years. I gave the man on that pulpit, I gave him the car they gave us on our wedding. I gave him. When I went to Lagos, they stole my car. So when I came back, I, you know, I come once in a month to visit my, my family, all right, without a car. So I was using bikes. I arrived at church before the man I gave a car. And the great one will not allow me rebuke him for seven years. In the sixth year, the man tried to start his own ministry with our members. I know you don't know this. I'm, I'm trying to tell you. And when I went to pray, you know what the great one said? Stand still and you shall see the salvation of God. I died. I died. So he, did, he didn't allow me to fight. And I assure you, I know how to fight. I, he said, mm, no. That if you fight now, I will increase your wilderness journey for two years. And I was already tired of the wilderness. So he left, he left by himself. The members he wanted, he left with them. They, what did God say? Stand still. I continued with the ones that remained. People said I was a fool. People said I was, they called me name. But you know what I had? He gave me intimacy with him. I know most of you don't know what intimacy with God means. You think he's speaking in tongues. Don't worry. This is the theory aspect of this meeting. We'll shift to practical. Then you will know that I met Jesus. And I'm not saying it boastfully. If I tell you otherwise, I didn't meet him, I lied. It was after the seven years that Jesus now said, now you can represent me among the nations. Do you understand? Wait, 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 wait. But even after he said that, it took an additional 12 years before he released me into it. <laughs> he that... You, I know some of you want to preach. You have seen pastors wear ties and you like the way they look. He that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. So the person I gave a car so that he can be more effective in the assignment was now the big man. I was using bikes to come to church. And I was using bike to go back, even though I gave him a car. Yes. And it happened like that for seven years. And the great one said, stand still. And Jesus increased in wisdom. That was how, 
wisdom. That's how wisdom came to me. You will soon find out when you start running a ministry that is big, that you need more of wisdom than an anointing. But you, 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 you are not aware yet. We have many preachers that are not wise, even old ones. This thing about wisdom is not age. It's not that I've been in ministry for 35 years. You, are, you can <coughs> May the Lord help you. May the Lord help you. <laughs> And Jesus increased what? Can you see that wisdom is first? Just like for John, spirit, he was strong. Where? In spirit was first. Wisdom here is first. So it means if you touch wisdom, if you touch Jesus, engage in a discussion with him, you will touch wisdom. There was something growing. And it was because of his orientation. His orientation made it possible for this thing to grow. Wisdom. So he grew more in wisdom than he grew in stature. He grew more in favor with God than he grew in favor with man. You are likely to see Jesus and you say, this is all that he is. And you try to fight him. What you are not seeing about him, we come, we fight, we fight you because he has he has found a place of favor in the heart of God. These are things that men no longer look for, they no longer look for favor with God. Men no longer desire to work strong in spirit, men no longer desire. the things that make for the development of that man that can carry the calling. Since you're already sober, let me, I'll just leave you here. I'll just... Are you still with me? Please help me tell your neighbor, let your life not be a joke. Let it not be a joke. The moment I passed that seven-year test, God began to enlarge me. People will be sick for years. And when I come there and pray, the same prayers that other people prayed, God will just heal the person. So I know it's God doing it. He wants to set me up. And he, he, he oh, you, you can't imagine. We'll just walk into a place, he will just do something. People will, I, me and him know the truth. He's just trying to make me visible by himself. I had the opportunity to promote myself for seven years using social media. I was on television before some of you got admission into this university. I'm not, I'm not joking. It's not even a laughing matter. I was on television. You will not believe me. With HD cameras. High definition. Sony. Yes. A time came, he said, gather all those videos, throw them up, out, and wait until I tell you to post them. I waited again. We had videos, but we were waiting for him to ask us to post. Meanwhile, the average preacher now believes that, okay, let's go on social media and be doing something every night. Ask yourself, how long can you do that thing? How long? At 70 years, will it, still be, will it still be wisdom for you to be doing it? If it is not wisdom, it means that's not your calling. He that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. You know the burden that came upon me when I came to, Co to Cape Coast is that many of you have veered off from the path of your calling. And that's why I'm sounding this alarm. Nebuchadnezzar has taken charge of your life. It was after this, because this scripture, this scripture that I read to you in the book of Luke chapter 2 about Jesus was a summary of 12 years. The next time we see Jesus, he was 12 years old. Are you there? Now, so maybe I will show you how this, a snapshot of Jesus as 12. Waxing strong, huh? increasing in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, which is a summary of 12 years. Let me now show you 12 years. Jesus at 12. Then I will, I will shut down. I 
Are you with me? All right, I'm coming. Give me a moment. This is not This is not part of my script. I just want to add it then I will When Jesus was 12, he was standing before the doctors of the law. That's the scripture that I'm looking for. What? Of Huh? Luke chapter 2, verse 1. All right, so let's go there. Luke 2, verse 1. All right, I'm coming, I'm coming. Um, Luke chapter 2, verse 1, 6. So. All right, so... Um, let me add two verses to it, Okay. Let's just do 46 and 47. I don't have the time to read. Luke chapter 2, verse 46 and 47. Then I will stop talking. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple. Now, stay with me. Are you with me? There is a historical perspective to this scripture. In the Jewish culture, in order for you to be a man, you must study the Torah, the four books of Moses, and at an appointed time of your convenience, you will stand before intelligent scholars, some Pharisees, some scribes. Then they will ask you questions, and then you will provide answers to the questions. And then if they consider you satisfactory, they will now declare you a man. Are you there? The moment they declare you a man, your mother is no longer permitted to look on your nakedness. And it doesn't matter how old you are. If the, this competition has not taken place, and you are, if you are not declared a man, no man will give you his daughter to marry. Are you, are you following me? Okay. So this is how Jesus became a man. So first of all, Jesus was not on schedule. They just came for the feast and they were going back home. He himself decided to tarry because he himself wanted to enroll himself. Are you there? He felt that he had attained manhood. So without the permission of his parents, he stayed back to go through the exercise with the doctors of the law. So he remained in Jerusalem. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Stop there. Are you still with me? Now, in the traditional situation, he's supposed to come and they will ask him questions. But the Bible says he was hearing them and asking them questions. Next verse. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. It means that the questions he asked the doctors of the Lord, they could not answer it. So he himself had to provide what? Yes. And people were astonished. <laughs> this is the portrait of Jesus at 12. A man growing in wisdom and in stature. A man growing in favor with God and what? In favor with... So he continued that way and this was the snapshot of Jesus as 30. He was better than the doctors of the law in the Torah. Are you following? Such that they were astonished at his answers. It means nobody ever gave answers to 
confusing theological issues like Jesus and he did it with so much grace. When the parents came, because they were not invited to the competition, the parents were not invited. It was an exclusive moment. No relative of his was there. The parents came and it was during the time that he was answering the questions that the parents were privileged to see that he had gone for manhood. The question I need to ask every young man here, are you a man? Because at this point, the reason for this exercise is that when you get married, after this, you can marry. When you get married, you will be a prolific teacher of your own children. And the burden of pastoring was not a minister's business, it was a father's business in Israeli culture. If you don't know the content of the Torah, you should not have a family. You can do business, you can trade, but you should not marry. And if you must marry, you can't marry an Israelite. You must go to the Philistines to look for a wife. Are you a man? If you have a child now, what will you tell him? Is there a walk you have with God that you can tell him, ah, oh, my son, in those days, when issues like this came, this was what we did. Your spiritual account, does he have any figure there? Or you are just a rolling stone? Thinking that by coming to Cape Coast, something is happening. Not knowing that you've been steadily eating from the king's table. And that's why Christianity is dying. Among the Muslims, there's a revival. They are regrouping. They are, they are manipulating statistics, census. Regrouping strongly. They have a prophecy that in these times there will be a revival and they will dominate. And they are trying hard, even in Ghana. But what is the voice of Christianity? We are confused. Prophesying about who will win an election. Looking for money. The destiny of Christianity lies with this our age bracket. Our fathers have tried. They can't bring anything to the table anymore. It's your own mileage that will determine if Christianity will travel. At the age of 13, he, 12, he was better than the doctors that were trained from the theological seminaries of the Pharisees. The depth of questions he asked their theology was short of providing answers. His family came to see him unveiling answers as a man of answers. There are too many questions in our nations begging for answers. When will the men come out? The men that have been approved by God, that have been given a stamp from heaven, when will they come out to bring answers? They met him doling out answers and in your family there are questions the patterns in the family are not consistent and you think that because you came to the university you have escaped those patterns by the time you finish from Cape Coast you will discover that the war just began what are you growing are you growing in your spirit is there wisdom that is binding your soul now wisdom for the days to come or oh, you are just another statistic coming to add to the problem. The question I asked before we round up is, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect another? Now, this is Jesus' picture at 12. I don't have time to show you his picture at 30. When God endorsed him and Satan knew of his address and knew his name. He was a colossus at that time. The die was cast. It was too late for the kingdom of darkness to, to reverse it. A kingdom was built in him. And anywhere he went, his vocal cord was for the kingdom. He revealed the mysteries of that land. Ah, he infected and infiltrated. He penetrated every aspect of society. He could not be stopped. He could not be stopped. Because those things that he disciplined himself to contain were now as much a part of him as his own beating heart. Are you the one who is to come? Should we expect another? When I was going for youth service, I said I was going to seek God. Finally. 
I was going to see God pray the way I've never prayed. I was going to fast the way I've never fasted. I was going to give the way I've never given. And I started on my program. Began to fast from January. I fasted February. I fasted March. I fasted April. I fasted May. I fasted June. I fasted July. I fasted August. August 1. August 2. August 3. August 4. August 5. August 8. Then the heavens opened a little. And God spoke to me. God, you know what he said? He said, I can see that you are fasting. <laughs> I've not eaten since January and you are coming to tell me that. <laughs> huh? Do you understand that? Well, I, I continue. Finished August, September. On the 20th of October. He wanted to visit me. Then he sent. Well, the, the number of the angels that I can tell you that I saw, the ones I interacted with, there were two of them. They were in the room for three days, but I did not know. Oh, my room had no, you know those nettings that I put on the room so that the mosquitoes would not come in? It had no netting. So my room was the parlor for mosquitoes. Those angels stood there. And mosquitoes didn't come into my room for days. I was, I was wondering, I said, what is this? Then I, and I started sensing that, okay, it may be God though. And I asked God, that, okay, if you are the one that is doing this thing, show me a sign. Then heat came on my head. I said, you know, I studied, I studied my mathematics very well. And uh, the probability of this heat coming, I calculated it. I told him. So if it is you, can you move it here? He moved it. So I calculated that one to him. I said, I'm not doubting you. It's just that you know I've gone to school. <laughs> he showed me signs that day that blotted out all my mathematics. That was when I saw the first angel. That was how my interaction with angels started. And I found out that what I was looking for was not lost. But it will never reveal itself to you until you are ready. Until your goal, your purpose or pursuit is pure. The child works strong in spirit and was in the deserts until the day of his showing forth to Israel. That means God managed his visibility. He was a mighty prophet, but God ensured that he was not visible. Though even if he goes on television, what's your, the name of your national television? GTV. All right. So even if he goes on GTV by nine, I say, I'm on television. Nobody will watch it because he's still in the wilderness. Nobody will see him. God will make it such that he will be covered until the day show you for you you have promoted yourself it means that there is no day of your showing forth go back into the closet your days of seeking mastery are not yet ended we must be stronger than our fathers if not Christianity we die in our time we must be strong we must be stronger most of our fathers grew, grew just in prayer they are, they are not deep in the world but they grew in prayer who must have two wings. You can't fly with one. So we have, we have the issue of inadequate discipleship in the body of Christ. We, we, have, we are shapeless, voiceless. And our numbers count for nothing. Politically, at least you know that. We can't decide and say, this is where we will go. And the church will move. We have no voice. So, so we have numbers that don't translate to power. We must be stronger than our ancestors for Christianity to survive. You must migrate away from the table of Nebuchadnezzar and build the much needed mastery required for you to survive the days that are upon us. In a moment, I'd like you to stand up quietly. Don't talk to your neighbor. Quietly. 